Hope you enjoyed lunch. Thank you to Eric for having me here. We were broadcasting upstairs earlier. Thank you to my panelists for being here. I'm going to introduce you guys. We have Monica with Ripple, president of Ripple. We have Stefan with Gico, and we have Everett with Roe. Probably familiar faces to many of the people in this room. Um, let's jump right into it, because with this panel, we're going to kind of look forward. I know it's been a year since SVB, which is just wild. It feels like more time than that has passed. But what has the last year meant, and where do we go from here? Um, Stefan, I want to start with you, because I actually started reading about your business shortly after the implosion of SVB, and I thought, wow, there's actually a company that does this, that looks at treasury risk and buys T-bills on behalf of their customers and manages all of that. You started this in 2016, though, which is so fascinating. That was the ZERP era, zero interest rate era. Why then? Is this even about interest rates? The origin story for GICO goes back probably to the start of my career. I started at Goldman Sachs in 2007, and I came with a PhD in applied mathematics. I was not trained on finance. So I start there, and a few months into it, Lehman blows up. And so the whole world goes belly up. If you remember those days, it was orders of magnitude more scary even than, than this event. And that never left me. I mean, the, it, it begged the same questions that we all have. Why does this keep happening? There's always the same stories, concentration risk and contagion risk and all that stuff. But it's always the same story. And so one thing led to another as I was seeing the inefficiencies in those banks. Can you not build one bank that no matter what happens in the financial system, can actually get the payroll delivered and get the money through. And the answer to that is T-bills. You need to go back to the source of money, connect people to the government directly, the same government that bails the banks. And so that's where GICO came from. So we, we were planting all this, knowing that it could happen again. And yeah, rates were at zero, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter as long as your money's safe. Moving forward to what happened in the wake of SVB when sort of it felt like Silicon Valley woke up to the risk, the treasury duration risk. So just to be clear, we, we, we provide our customers with T-bills, the short term ones, the ones that as the core liquidity block for, for anyone who needs liquidity. But many startups, right, they parked their money in a Silicon Valley bank. Most of them were Silicon Valley bank. They didn't even think about investing it in T-bills, right? No, because A, first, most people are, I mean, if you're a startup founder or most treasurers, you're, you've got the money at a bank. You, your job's to, you have so many other things to worry about, and we heard that this morning. So the, the idea that you could plug straight into T-bills, it's a very antiquated product. You can mostly access it through the government. So we just made it very, very accessible, but it was not something people had in their minds until then. Right. Monica, looking back on the last year, how has it changed your business at Ripple? Well, of significance of the three banks that were kind of the first to fall over, the three S's, Silvergate and Signature Bank in the world, of, so Ripple's in the cryptocurrency blockchain space, and so those two banks in particular were very systemically important to the cryptocurrency ecosystem. It was commonly the two ways to get US dollar, connect the US dollar system into the crypto ecosystem. So it had a pretty consequential effect on the whole, the whole crypto world and ecosystem. Flash forward to 2024, where we are today, there, there haven't really been other US banks who have leaned into being a transaction bank of record to different crypto companies. Uh, so I think there's still, a, there's an overhang of risk aversion, I would say, and I think that also is somewhat an after effect of the, situ the fraud and uh, activity related to FTX and Binance. I remember at the time speaking to a founder who had just raised you know, a seed round and he was about to get the money and deposit it into SVB when everything blew up and he was searching for another banking relationship. The kind of, the narrative, at least that I hear at CNBC and talking to the folks that I do is that the big banks came in, you know, suddenly a lot of folks were risk adverse and they wanted to park their money in the safest spot possible. So a lot of them went to the big banks and JP Morgan. I know that uh, Monica Smith was talking here today and she runs sort of their startup business. Everett, has the gap been filled by SVB over the last year, the, the really important role that they played in the startup and VC ecosystem? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thank you. I'm Everett Cook. I'm CEO and co-founder of Roe. Roe is a financial automation platform, and we offer business banking, corporate cards, AP, spend management uh, in a single platform, um, ranging from two-person startups to 3,000-person private equity-backed companies. And so when, we, when SVB Weekend happened, uh, you know, we were inundated like some of the other folks that spoke earlier and, and probably will speak later on the panel. 
And startups wasn't the majority of our business at the time. Um, it was a smaller portion, but still a really important one. But since then, you know, I would politely disagree with that that statement that there is no gap in the market. I think we believe that there's, you know, that founders are looking for a much better solution than SVB. And while like I think the services that they delivered are are still there, I think the market has moved. And I think the market's moved towards uh, companies looking for a, a product and fintech really filling that void in terms of products that cannot just store your money, but help you run your business better and help you operate more efficiently. And so when we think about ourselves, we're really a product company and we partner with banks to make sure that our, our, you know, our, our customer deposits are safe and com regulatory compliant and, and all those things. But we really think customer first in a way that you know, I think it's really tough for a bank to, to do. And so I think that it's, there's this symbiotic relationship between fintech and bank that is evolving that is, I think, really healthy for the whole ecosystem, whether you're a startup founder or whether you're, you know, frankly, the government too, like because you're able to deliver a better product and also have sort of specialization. Right, but, you know, someone from JP Morgan might argue that they have, you know, this <laughs> virtuous flywheel, right, where they can fund, they can give you debt financing, they can still, you know, give you equity financing, sure. they can manage the whole relationship. So, Stefan, I wonder, do you think that this is an opportunity for fintech, or do you think that it's actually set that opportunity back by concentrating more money in the big banks? I mean, it's, it's an opportunity for fintech, and I mean, we, we see it firsthand. You know, JP Morgan does, does a phenomenal job at many things. I think for companies that want a better operating system for their business and want to operate in a, the way that they're probably used to with other you know, technology for software products, they're going to come to us. If they want you know, the institutional name of JP Morgan, they'll go to JP Morgan. I think we do have different things to offer. Stefan, how has it changed your business? How have you seen, how's growth look like since SVB? Pretty massive for us, just to clarify for the audience, the way we distribute our product mostly is by making it available to others, fintechs, banks even. There are bank banks who, you heard it this morning, even SVB had money market funds. Everyone has to diversify their cash. So we're, we're offering this checkable, we call it bankable treasuries. We offer that to anyone who wants it. And when we when, to answer your question on the fintechs, fintechs is a broad, 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 broad sector. In some sense, Apple, Google are also fintechs. And when you look at that space, there's no bank right now that, that's been even big enough to, like everyone's heard the stories of Goldman and Apple divorcing. You need enterprise grade scale there. You need the stability of T-bills. And that's the kind of, we're, we're partly, we're, we're getting a lot of demand for enterprise type deals that just bring scale. And that's where the T-bills come in. How have you taken advantage of the opportunity though that SVB left? Um, by staying focused on these type of deals, the large deals that bring us where we have large corporate treasury platforms, large RAs, things that have real need for cash right now, for cash safety, cash storage, cash, uh, cash diversification, and also servicing some of the crypto community because there's a real vacuum there and we're very happy to onboard some of, some of the exchanges as well. We've, we've seen like a, just a, a really big shift in that direction too where we, we offer our checking account as well as like insured product, a $75 million FDIC insured product and, and T-bills. And prior to SVB, when we launched that product, I thought there would be a lot of uptake and there really wasn't. Uh, we thought founders would not leave, park millions of dollars in an uninsured account and a lot of them did. Post SVB, that behavior changed dramatically and I think everybody's very conscious about, about that. Monica, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about your outlook for the regulatory space, something that you and Ripple know well. And full disclosure, I'm Canadian, so I have to transfer money sometimes between Canada and the US, and it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I've lived here now for eight years and it hasn't gotten any better. And Ripple with XRP sets out to solve that problem. And I know you're making progress globally in other countries, but in the US, you're kind of in limbo. Is it fair to say that? Yeah, I would say that, um, I mean, the, so the very premise of a blockchain is you now have a new financial rail where there's open access all around the world to something that's instantaneous where you can transfer and move and exchange different forms of value all over the world really quickly and seamlessly. So we've applied it to payments. So exactly your use case of getting money just across the border between Canada and the US in a cost-effective and, and transparent way, um, that's exactly the problem that we seek to solve. I would say our, our business, our network has had the most uptake places where there has been regulatory clarity for licensed financial institutions who are our customers to use a crypto rail. So that's places like Singapore and Dubai and even Europe. Uh, Europe, 27 countries came together to form the MICA regulation, which is a common framework to handle crypto assets, whereas the US 
there's you know a regulatory battlefield between the different agencies to yeah. to fight for territory and do you see that as sort of like blocking your business or hurdles for your business, or do you see it as almost like a necessary evil? I think back to Coinbase, right? And a few years ago, they weren't able to expand in the way that FTX or some of the other crypto companies were able to, and in the end, they're still standing, at least. So do you think that that tighter regulation, that more stringent regulation is ultimately good or bad for the crypto industry at large? I think regulation is good, clear regulation though. So we're, we have kind of chaotic, a chaotic regulatory climate for crypto in the US right now. Companies like Ripple and Coinbase and Circle, these we're US based companies and we actually kind of, we held a really high bar for meeting compliance. Uh, the same bar that banks meet for KYC, AML, OFAC, BSA, I mean, we, we follow all the same standards. And the businesses that are operating outside of the US where they're performing regulatory arbitrage, you think of the FTXs of the world, um, that's where you see the trouble and then there's this kind of political weight thrown into focusing on the fraud cases whereas the actual really useful use cases for the technology kind of get suffocated. Everett, I wonder if you could talk about your relationship with regulators and if you think that they're kind of helping or slowing you guys down. Sure. So I think that the the regulators have been done, I think, a great job over the past sort of year and a half of being much clearer about bank fintech partnerships and what's, I think, you know, the right way to do that, what's the wrong way to do that. You know, we've tried to pursue a compliance first, regula regulatory uh, compliance first approach because we believe like you play a strong, uh, you're able to play offense by playing a strong defense. And so, um, and so we were really proactive in building our own infrastructure and a direct relationship with our sponsor bank, Webster Bank, which is a nationally chartered bank that has $65 billion in assets. Uh, one of the few fintechs that um, put ourselves to that, to that, to that test um, in terms of partnering with a bank at that, at that threshold. I think that that's the direction the market's going, which is the regulators are, you know, want to see direct bank fintech partnerships. I think what they do not want to see is third parties in between those partnerships, vast providers that are, you know, not directly engaged with one side or the other. And I think that's, if you look at a lot of the challenges that the space has had over the past couple of years, it's usually been driven by, by that, in, in, either directly or indirectly. So I think that, that, that you know, we're moving towards a place where there's a lot more clarity, and I think that's a positive thing, and I think the regulators are doing an awesome job. Stefan, I love how a moment ago you brought up this idea of mega caps as sort of the largest fintechs around. And it is just kind of amazing what Apple has been able to do with its own balance sheet and a savings account that I think offers you 4.5% APY now. How much do you guys think about and consider big tech as partners, frenemies, disruptors to what you are doing or helping your cause? I mean, again, back, back to why we started GECO is, is I was from within banking, seeing all the mess, to some extent, within the back offices and all this, and asking, where's Google, where's Amazon, why is this not being cleaned up? I mean, I, the 2008 was also COBOL mainframes exploding in the back office, people not knowing where the wires were and the, and, the, and, and the money. So there is really a need for money to be delivered where you actually interact. Do you need banks, do you need tellers, or can you just interact it all through your phone? Those, those mega caps there, that's where the money should be embedded. So we. We, I, I firmly believe that that's where things are going are headed. A few concentration points with those firms, and then this intermediation where lending comes in and others are plugging in there. Our role is to be the platform, ideally, where everybody sits on top, which is the neutral layer that clears all the payments. That's I firmly see that coming. So threat or front of me, or how do you see big techs that are entrenching themselves deeper in the fintech world? At least for uh, for us. Uh, Money is regulated. There's always going to be the need for a bank partner. That's what we're talking. That's what we're talking. You need a few banks that are clean that can handle this. And Apple, for many reasons, never really, or at least for a long time, should will not get a bank license. So you need that synergy that that, wrote, that uh, Emirates is describing, where banks work with with Apple. So I don't think of Apple as a threat to us. It's the opposite. You yeah, go ahead, Everett. Oh, no, I was going to say, I think, luckily, if you look at those companies, too, that you talked about, they are, you know, phenomenal, the best consumer businesses in the world, right? Every, every person in this room touches those companies many times a day. You know, banking is not just consumer. That's one part of it. You know, and, and as you get down, we do B2B. There is, it's, I think there's a much, 
you know, a bunch of different sort of uh, service you need to provide and product you need to deliver to the end user. And I think that that's, you know, that's pretty far outside the scope of those companies. Right. So they're not interested in B2B. I, I mean, never think? say never, but, but certainly like, you know, we haven't seen any interest. Okay. Monica, we've seen a lot happen in the last uh, year with crypto, Bitcoin, you know, fully institutionalized on Wall Street with ETFs and all-time highs. Are you optimistic that this is going to have more lasting power, that we're going to see more progress? Because it's sort of been like two steps forward, one step back for a long time. Do you think that we're kind of in a period of acceptance, and how will that impact your business? Yeah, it does feel very cyclical, right? Like the a roller coaster, maybe that's a better description. So I've been at Ripple for 11 years, and so I've seen a few of these uh, booms and bust cycles. Coming up this year is the Bitcoin halving in April. So this is a four-year cycle. And with more constrained uh, supply and increased demand, there's, this yeah. is kind of why we see this, this boom cycle uh, continuously happening. The introduction, the approval of the Bitcoin spot ETFs and the introduction of those products in the US has been very meaningful for the institutionalization and legitimization of the industry. And I think that, well, actually, an interesting fact is, because you might kind of attribute it to, well, there's just a lot of excitement about the halving. But if you rewind time a little bit, Goldman and BlackRock and Robinhood, these large institutions launched their kind of crypto products in the bear market. Uh, like Goldman introduced their $100 million uh, tokenization fund uh, to tokenize bonds. That was in the bear cycle. So I think that there's a real long-term buy-in and belief by the institutions that this technology is not going away. Right. And also, I think a belief in Bitcoin as a store of value, as an asset class. And Stephane, it, it's so interesting to look at what you do, which is traditional T-bills backed by the U.S. government. But what we're seeing is sort of money start to flow into Bitcoin in the same way that gold is an alternative to the dollar. So I know this is like kind of this is long term, but it's also like an existential question. Do you ever think about offering something backed by Bitcoin? We introduced T-bills in 2016 because for day to day payments, people need the stability of the dollar the, the, and, and still for foreseeable future. Um, but our the entire tech stack that we built at Jiko, and even the name Jiko, it means self in Japanese. It's all about mapping you to whatever your assets are. Right now, we do T-bills. We're here to help you with payments and, and all, all these companies. But nothing in our and what we do is blockchain incompatible. On the contrary, I, we, we're, we're big fans, and there's lots of good stuff we'll be able to do as a regulated bank over over time in the space. So, do you foresee yourself ever having some kind of Bitcoin cryptocurrency product? Possibly, who knows? Tokenized T-bills are kind of a new uh, preference to stable coins because you can get yield on them. In, in fact, I would say the, the blockchain plays the role as the, the data layer where, where the original source of money or assets are. Right now, for, for those who know T-bills, that's actually going through. Most people don't even know where, they, where do the T-bills start. You, you probably don't really know. It's somewhere at DTCC. There's an auction. Well, where is the, how many are there and where are they? Blockchain cleans that up. You what you do need to have then regulated institutions that say, this is your coin, this is your asset, this is your tokenized T-bill. Now, so where I cover fintech is a lot in the public markets. We saw a lot of companies, a lot of hype around fintech companies in 2021, kind of the peak of markets. And ever, it, there was so much promise, right, of better infrastructure, better ways of doing things. And it feels like over the last few years, that has become somewhat commoditized. The big banks have the capital and the ability to do some of that. We talked backstage about buy now, pay later, right? And how Afterpay went to Square for 39, I think, 30, I think 20, 39 billion, 39 yeah. billion dollars, um, which you just can't imagine them paying for today. When do we see sort of a better infrastructure. It's been kind of like crypto and fits and starts. And we use this example of like IBM. No one ever fired anyone right. for using IBM and it's in a much different position. Are we going to see that tipping point in fintech when fintech companies take off and become, yeah. you know, multi hundred billion dollar companies like a PayPal, which has fallen a long Was, way as yeah. well. Yeah. I mean, look, I think that markets, you know, look, markets get ahead of themselves and sometimes they're overly pe pessimistic too. Mm -hmm. uh, and before this, I was, I was, I spent my life in markets. So it's something I, I think a lot about, but you know, the, the underlying story of fintech, I don't think went away. And so yes, 2021 in hindsight, mm -hmm. markets clearly got ahead of themselves pricing in that, you know, interest rates were going to be zero forever. 
whatever, you know, whether, whatever market, whether you're a fintech market or T-bills or oh, sorry, treasury market or something else. But like fintechs continue to innovate. I think the good ones continue to focus on their customer and build better products and experiences. And I believe like right now you're starting to see that really happen and you're starting in the later stage companies the larger more established companies like that are public like sofi you know are starting to show that earnings power are starting to turn profitable and so i think actually you know we had this bear market but the 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 power of the business model and the power of you know just staying focused on your customer delivering a better customer experience and you know building inside this massive tam i think is is only starting and so i think that that's that's uh but yeah it, it's it takes a while and i think sometimes we always underestimate how long these things take I also uh, talked to you about my frustration with Concur. How many people have to use Concur? This is like a startup <laughs> space. So I don't, yeah, if you, <laughs> some right. other audiences, it would be like everyone. Um, but expense management product that my corporation, NBC Universal, uses. Yes. Everybody hates it. I'm not alone. Who, who likes it? <laughs> Universally disliked, uh, folks at NBC Universal. If you want to give us a call, we're happy to happy but, to have but, a conversation. You know, and, and you, in fintechs, many fintechs yourselves have been really good at serving kind of the small and medium-sized companies. And even you bring up a SoFi. Yeah. How do you get real scale? How do you get the Comcasts and the big corporations to use what is clearly a better product? Yeah. What's stopping them? So we think about it as we have we have companies from two people that are using us as their first bank account to three thousand person organizations that you know are using Row primarily as a spend management tool and people in the middle that are that are doing both. And how do you get to like a hundred thousand, three hundred thousand employees? Like you said, yeah, three thousand, right? Uh, I mean, there, there, again, like there's there's no reason we haven't we haven't just but we haven't we haven't really made that phone call. So happy to talk to talk to your team, but uh, but I think in terms of the you know the solution, it's really just provi providing a better product. And for us, it's linking linking software with financial services, which is really why everyone dislikes that that experience. Is because you have an American Express card, you swipe it, and you have to reconcile. That should be automatic, and that's what we do, bro. Okay, with just about one minute left, I want to ask you guys each just a quick answer. What do you think is the biggest opportunity a year out from the bust of SVB? And that can really be anything relating to your business, relating to the bigger, the broader banking space for startups, Monica? Actually, dovetailing from what the conversation we were just having, uh, much, absolutely right, user experience wins all, right, for fintechs. But in a lot of cases, uh, the fintech layer is lipstick on a pig. So like the underlying infrastructure, the problem of trying to move Canadian dollars to US dollars in an in instant, uh, instant settlement, it has to do with the actual wiring of the infrastructure, which is still so outdated. It's like 1970s, you know, closed networks, the analogy of AOL and CompuServe and Genie being completely closed computer networks that don't talk to each other. This is where, obviously, I'm going to be a believer in blockchain as the bet for the, next, the year ahead. Great answer. Stefan? I think it's it's around trusted infrastructure, yes, because the, the the key message from this morning is what happens to the trust. I mean, SVB is rebuilding it, but do you need to have trust because of handshakes or just because you know that the institutions or the core infrastructure are just scalable? There's a real vacuum that's there right now, 11,000 banks, but no one's really stepping up, maybe JP. So it's it's really about building a trusted, trusted layer. Everett, last word. Yeah, I think that... Uh, I like the point that our earlier um, panelists said, which is fintech went from an option to the default, and I think that that is uh, that is true in the startup space, and I think that's becoming true in the broader economy. SMBs are choosing fintechs as their primary choice, not something that you have to really sell in. It's something that is starting to sell itself, and that's um, I think just going to drive a sea change in the whole industry. Everett, Stefan, Monica, thank you so much. That was great. Thank panel. you. Great thank insights. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.